We're here with Mike Cassidy, who is the Director of Product Management at Google and the founder and CEO of four startups prior to that. And Mike, I just wanted to ask you about, um, you typically advise that speed is the most crucial element in a startup success. And I want to know, is having deep experience in a market really necessary for implementing speed um, in the development of your company? Um, you say that you know hiring known talent quickly is important, and knowing what kinds of innovation will capture market share is really important. But how can an entrepreneur implement speedy, iterative development um, in the absence of years of experience? So, uh, interestingly enough, all the four companies I did were in quite different areas. Uh, one was in computer telephony, linking telephones and databases together. One was an internet search engine. Uh, the third one was an instant messenger for online PC video gamers. And the fourth one was a recommendation site uh, based on recommendations from your friends. So all four were quite different areas, and I believe it's possible to go into different areas and learn about that area um, quickly and come up with ideas once you get in the area. So you didn't have special prior knowledge prior to getting into these regions. You were just a quick study? Right. I didn't know anything about any of those four areas before I joined them. And I, I always joke that it's frustrating for me because in the beginning when I start my companies, nobody will return my phone calls. Nobody knows me at all. And eventually after a year or so, the company is doing well and then people start calling me back. But it's always a fresh start in every, in every industry I go into. But so what special techniques, did, did you employ any special techniques in quickly learning the landscape? Did you develop over time techniques for assessing what you needed to learn, when? Um... Yes, so I believe in launching your product about three or three and a half months after you start the company, mm -hmm. and then just iterating quickly with um, sort of improvements to the product over time. And I believe by launching quickly and then iterating, you can adjust to the market and find what people really want. For example, my third company, Xfire, uh, we launched the product three months after we sort of came up with that idea. And then every two weeks for the next year, we were coming out with a new version of Xfire. And the first version was pretty simple, didn't do a lot of the things the final version did, but we kept listening to the customers and kept iterating. And it's really hard for competitors to stay at the pace you're going, and so eventually you keep up. One of the analogies I like to use is, uh, any chess player can beat a gra grandmaster chess player if I can move twice every time the grandmaster can only move once. Uh, so you didn't have, a, you didn't come up with the innovation right at the beginning. You really just, it was the pace of your iteration that developed these innovations. And how can you sustain that pace? Does it have to do with scaling your business? Does it have to do with the quality of the people you hire? What is the crucial element for, habit, for sustaining this level of iteration? That's a great question. Um, I often am asked to give advice to people who have a company and that's struggling a little bit. And they'll say, Mike, I've got this problem. Uh, the team is, is not working as hard. It's, it's kind of um, a little bit slower getting stuff out. How can I get them to work faster? And I always say, you're asking the wrong question at the wrong time. Um, what you've got to get is people who are similar minded at the very beginning. When I do my interviews with people, I ask them questions in the interview that I try to get across this sort of intensity of pace. Like I ask them, how do you cook dinner? And some of them will say, oh, well, I don't know. I put something in the oven and I wait and an hour later it's ready. Other people will say, oh, I time everything. I want to eat it exactly at 6 o'clock. So I have a schedule three minutes before 6, I put the broccoli in. At 10 minutes before 6, I have the water start to boil so it's ready when I put the broccoli in. At 22 minutes before, I start the salad. And that's the kind of people I want to in my startup company. So you're really selecting for precision, basically. You want to psychologically pre-select your team. This is the most important thing, to psychologically pre-select your team for... Um... Absolutely. You're selecting for a competitive spirit. You want people who want to win. You're selecting for ownership. Uh, everyone who joins my companies takes uh, a pay cut, but they get equity in the company. And then it, so far, it's paid off for everyone. We, we made. 22 millionaires at my second company, we made seven millionaires at my third company. Uh, so yes, you select for people who take ownership for the product. Uh, I don't like people who say, well, that's Charlie's responsibility. I want everyone to say, well, I see something wrong, I'll fix it. 
Okay. And how much of that comes just intact in the people that you select, and how much do you incentivize ownership? So I'm kind of a cynic about some of these things. I think the best, behave, the best predictor of future behavior is, your, is past behavior. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe I can go get people and get them to be, have, feel more ownership and more passion. You've got to find people who have that in them to start with. And I find them everywhere. Uh, one of the most important guys on the second company I had never worked with before, but I played Ultimate Frisbee with this game where you throw the Frisbee back and forth and you run up down yeah, the field. Yeah. He was an amazing Ultimate Frisbee player. He would dive, lay his body out full across the field, and I said, I bet he's good to work with, and he was awesome. He was fantastic. Really? Yeah. Really? Amazing. And what kind of numbers are we talking? Can you, can you throw out any numbers in terms of, you know, when you do get this iteration going at this pace and you have your team, I mean, what levels, like, what, how successful what, are companies? Yeah, yeah. How, what, what, how does that translate into monetary sure. value? So uh, I've, I've been very lucky. Um, the first company we only raised, uh, I put in $500 and each of my two friends put in $500. So we had $1,500. We didn't raise any venture capital. We sold that one for $13 million. The second company we raised uh, $1.4 million in venture capital in the, in the first round. And 500 days later, we sold it for $500 million. So we joked around, we we're making a million dollars a day. Uh, this, the third company we sold about two years after we launched it for, uh, for $110 million uh, to MTV. So yes, with this quarter speed, I think you can generate significant amounts of you know, market value and also a significant amount of user usership. The second company, the, direct, the uh, search engine, we were s serving 50 million people within a, a little over a year who were using our search engine. And the third company, uh, Xfire, I think we have over 15 million people using the product now. We had a couple million people by the end of the second year using it. So. Amazing. So what you're saying is it's really not the seed funding that's the issue. It's really the team that you hire that's going to be the critical factor in your success. The people are everything, totally yeah. everything. And it's a, everyone says that, but when you, when you really live it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, the amount of money you have to start with, I don't think is, is actually that critical. Okay. Um, to switch tax for a moment, I just want to pick your mind about the future of the web. Um, I don't know if you read a recent article in Wired called The, the Web End is the Dead, web. Long yeah. Live the Internet, about how we're shifting, as consumers, we're shifting from browsing on the open web to paying for highly curated experiences in apps, things like the iPad, the iPhone. Um, yeah. How is Google responding to that, or more generally, um, what sort of product innovation would you advise, given this trend? Do you believe this trend? Yeah, so uh, one of the reasons I'm totally excited to be at Google is um, we're, we're huge proponents of the open web. Um, I mean, for example, Android is our, our, you know, our phone operating system. Hmm. We're turning on over 200,000 times every day someone's activating an Android phone. Um, and uh, so in, in the search world, we are doing at any given time between 50 and 100 experiments for improving the quality of search. So we're always sort of making it faster, finding new content. Um, uh, we have over a billion people a week searching on our site, so we're using that information from the searches they do to come with, with new things. But no, we believe in the open web. We believe that um, you know, over time, the open systems are the one that eventually win. You can look at through all history, you know, the, the various things. Certainly, there are advantages to, uh, in the short term, sort of a closed systems having less interoperable parts where things can go wrong. But over eventually, the open systems always win. Okay. All right. That makes sense. I just have one more question for you. Um, given that approach, that Google is always solidly going to be in that camp. Um, what are innovations in, in the Middle East, in the Arab world, that a startup company could develop that Google would be interested in? Um, interesting question. Um, I, I'm really excited about the Arab world. Uh, as you know, I was here uh, a few months ago in Jordan, mm -hmm. um, and I met a lot of exciting entrepreneurs. I'm meeting a lot of exciting entrepreneurs today. Um, I think okay. some of the things that are most exciting um, to me are location-based technology. Um, I think there's a lot of things you can do with location-based technology in the Arab world where uh, sort of through the phone systems or other technologies, you can locate people and services and products 
um, whether it's uh, you know machine to machine connections or uh, location inside your phones or uh, you know lots of GPS devices inside phones and there's yeah. all sorts of things you can do where you can expose to people different services they might want or different ways of finding your friends I mean right here at this conference there's this technology where you can find certain people at the conference by using location so Google as you know Google Maps is a very popular feature and we're always interested in location-based things and things with maps and I think there's lots of opportunity there so in terms of building Arabic content into that? I mean, what would make it unique in the region? I'm sorry, can you say that? What would, what would make it unique in the region? And building Arabic content into location-based services? Or how important is Arabic content? Uh, you know, today at Google, more than half of all of our revenue comes outside the US. So uh, the Arab region with 300 million uh, you know, consumers is a tremendous opportunity for us, whether it's Arabic content or even innovative ideas. Um, as you know, uh, companies like Maktoub uh, or Jira are coming up with really cool uh, technologies uh, that is very interesting to, uh, to, to Western companies and Western internet companies. So I think there's tons of opportunity. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much for having me. me.